Well, welcome everyone to the Hourly to Exit podcast. I am so happy to have Patty Block with me here today. Thank you for joining me, Patty. Oh, my pleasure. I'm glad to be here. Patty is a huge pro. I'm going to let her introduce herself to you, but I will say I hear her name from many different corners of the ecoverse. I don't even know what we call this thing that we are we are involved in, and uh, and many of them I'm pretty sure don't know about each other. So. Um, her name comes up quite a bit in this space. So I was very excited to have her on. There are many things that she can talk to us about, um, but we are going to focus on revenue models and pricing today. But before we dive in, Patty, would you introduce yourself to the audience? Sure. I'm Patty Block. When I was growing up, my mom used to make these fabulous cookies. The whole house smelled good, it was warm, the cookies were gooey. And all my life, I watched my mom eat the broken cookies, but it wasn't until I was a teenager that I even thought to ask her, why do you only eat the broken cookies? Do they taste better? And she laughed and said, no, I eat the broken cookies so you can have the whole ones. And not too long ago, I saw this really shocking statistic. 62% of women rely on their business for their primary income and 88% of women-owned businesses make less than $100,000 a year. And all of a sudden, this image of my mom eating the broken cookies popped in my head because I started connecting the dots and realizing in all the years that I've worked with women business owners, we are bringing that spirit of self-sacrifice into our businesses and creating a self-imposed glass ceiling. Mm -hmm. And my mission became helping women business owners understand that dynamic and work to change it because you really can run your business your way. That's fantastic. I love that. Uh, and, you know, it is true. We both work with women and, uh, you know, I, I can't say I have a nice little anecdote like that. That's fantastic. But we do find that there are differences. I mean, yes, business is business, but we do bring ourselves to it, right? And, and that there are some differences about the way um, women's, you know, either emotional intelligence or sense of self-sacrifice or mindset issues that sometimes we approach some of these issues differently. And so the conversations are different. Some of the vocabulary is different. Um, so uh, that, that's great. So this is this is an audience of mostly women um, business owners. So I did want to uh, ask you know, who your typical client is and, um, and did you pick your niche of women before or after your broken cookie realization? <laughs> Both of those are great questions. Uh -huh. So the women that I work with typically are experts in their fields. Mm -hmm. So they're often accountants, attorneys, their uh, engineers and marketing and PR professionals. So they're often technical experts. I also have kind of a specialty in the elder care industry and have worked with multiple companies. And of course that industry is really booming, whether that's unfortunate or fortunate is hard to say, but there are a lot of needs for the elder population. Mm -hmm. so, um, so I work with technical experts and the common theme running through that is I'm also a technical expert. I also am really good with numbers and I'm a good consultant and I provide a great service that gets great results, just like my clients do. But a lot of us were not trained on how to run a business. And so we believe that somebody else has the answer. And we start listening to gurus, to experts, to people that give us kind of a cookie cutter approach. And I have found that doesn't work. And it especially doesn't work for women because to your earlier point, we think differently, we feel differently, we behave differently than most men. And that again, is not a good or a bad thing. It's a different thing. Right. And that is why I work exclusively with women business owners. So the funny thing is, to your second question, I selected to work with women business owners when I started my company in 2006. 
And at that time, it felt very risky. Mm -hmm. And I had people who questioned me about that. Some of my mentors who said, are you sure you want to cut out half the market? And I said, well, let's check the stats <laughs> because the statistics show it's not half the market mm -hmm. and that women business owners are becoming much, much more common. There are more wi women willing to take that leap of faith. And that's where I know I have the biggest impact. So when I originally did that almost 16 years ago, it was a differentiator for my company. Now it no longer is. Mm, yeah. And so that's been an interesting evolution. I have to say, I'm delighted that there are so many more providers focusing on women business owners. There are so many more women business owners mm -hmm. and the women are becoming more successful. Mm -hmm. So that really is, a, is very rolled up into my message and my mission because it's about empowering women. Yeah. And, you know, knowing who you're talking to, you know, makes a big difference in, in your outreach and how you're developing programs and things like that. But it's funny that someone would mention, you know, you're cutting off half of the market. Well, like how many people can you serve? Right. I mean, so many people, you know, I mean, one of your one of your expert yeah, expert uh, teases is, is talking about segmentation and specialization in niches. And as we know uh, that, you know, niching is not a bad thing is a good thing. Um, but it's, but I would imagine that 16 years ago that it was absolutely foreign, you know, to, to do that. So that was very brave of you. And yes, I'm also glad that there are a lot of uh, women thinking very strategically about their businesses now, and they are getting help. They understand the opportunities and they're willing to invest in themselves and in their businesses to, to help grow it. So, so this is kind of a nerdy question because it's one that I myself have, have uh, struggled with, which is using the term business owner versus entrepreneur versus founder. Do you use them interchangeably? Did, did it mean something to you to use business owner versus the other terms? You know, it's an interesting question because different people will give you different answers. And when we think of an entrepreneur, so I think of it as a verb. We are entrepreneurial mm -hmm. and I don't worry too much about the labels. Mm -hmm. So for example, I never call myself a business coach mm -hmm. because to me, that's a relatively meaningless term because anyone can call themselves a coach and there are 500 million coaches out there. Mm -hmm. So I never use that term, but my clients refer to me as a business coach. Mm -hmm. So I kind of go with the flow because I'm not too worried about labels. Mm -hmm. And I think of, we all have that entrepreneurial spirit or we wouldn't be doing what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And that is really a different mindset. So a lot of my clients come out of a corporate career mm -hmm. and they've been with a big accounting firm, a big law firm, or they a big firm where they, a lot of my engineering clients are biomedical engineers, are system engineers, industrial. And so they've also come out of a big company. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned earlier, often we don't really know how to run a company, but we are really great at providing our service. So all of that, I, I think of myself as a business owner and I have an entrepreneurial spirit and I've learned to think like an entrepreneur Mm -hmm. which again is very different than thinking like an employee. Right. And the biggest difference for me is as an entrepreneur, as a business owner, I'm spending my own money. As an employee, I'm spending somebody else's money. Mm -hmm. And that's a huge distinction in my mind because we all think about the money coming in, the revenue and, and how we go out and find our ideal clients. But I think of the expense side of, how am I spending money? How am I making those decisions? Because the top line revenue is only a fraction of the story. It's really the bottom line revenue that we need to be paying more attention to. Well, that is an excellent segue to what we're going to focus on today, which is revenue, revenue models, and pricing. So I would love to, by the way, I, I like to joke that this is like 
my podcast is free coaching because I ask all the questions that I have about these things because I am my avatar. And so, uh, so I love to start with some definitions, revenue model, pricing, their relationship to each other, why they're important. You bet. These are not things we typically think about as women business owners. Mm -hmm. We don't typically develop our business model and our revenue model and then start our business. Mm -hmm. We do it the other way around. We start our business, we provide the service, and then we, we hear in the marketplace these terms and this jargon, and we think, oh, well, I don't have one of those. You do, you have a business model. Mm -hmm. And by business model, I mean the way you deliver your service, the way you charge your clients, how you collect those funds, all of that is part of your business model, including how you get your message out and your marketing, your business development and your sales. And I'm gonna make a quick distinction from those three terms because I think there's a lot of misunderstanding. Marketing is about visibility. So that's how you get your message out. It's uh, in some circumstances, you could generate leads that way, mm -hmm. but that's for my company, it's not how I generate leads. Most of my leads come from referrals, introductions, and speaking engagements. Mm -hmm. And I have found that to be true of most of my clients as well. Mm -hmm. So the challenge is that we often pour a ton of money into marketing and spend a huge amount of time and nobody's really listening or paying attention. Mm -hmm. So that's the marketing piece is about visibility. The business development piece is where women really excel. And that is about building relationships. Mm -hmm. And that leads to sales, which a lot of women don't want to talk about. And what I, what I realized when I started my company, I did what everybody does. I started taking all these programs. I started trying to figure out how am I going to price? How am I going to sell? How do I want to present myself to my audience? Who is my audience, right? I started in the same place and I took tons of programs and it was very frustrating. But what I've now done, I've recognized patterns. I've developed my own intellectual property. I have put the pieces together so that I can shortcut it for my clients. They don't have to go through all that frustration. <laughs> yeah. So going back to the idea of business model versus revenue model. Mm -hmm. So you have a business model, just like you have a reputation. Now, you might not like your reputation. You might not like your business model, but you have the power to change it. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of what you and I are talking about is kind of coming awake, this awareness of this business model has served me for three years and it kind of isn't working anymore. Mm -hmm. But if you don't know how to change it or what would work better for you, that's a huge frustration. And in fact, this happened to millions of business owners when the COVID-19 pandemic hit. Mm -hmm. And there were many business owners who realized that their business model of meeting in person didn't work. Mm -hmm. And they were so limited. And so a lot of companies certainly pivoted to vir virtual meetings, but they had to pivot in other ways too. And they may have lost clients. Mm -hmm. so, so that's the business model idea. The revenue model is not only the pricing of what you charge for your services and how you charge and how you communicate that, but it is also different streams of revenue. So for example, if you offer one-on-one -on -one consulting, mm -hmm. that's one revenue stream. Mm -hmm. If you then develop a membership program, that's a second revenue stream. And most companies have multiple streams. And it's a really good strategy because then you don't literally have all your eggs in one basket. Right. So uh, what I would say is, depending on your point in your business life cycle, you have a business model and a revenue model, but you might not have examined it and determined what works best for you. And that goes back to what I said earlier about 
What I really do, if you boil it down, is I help women business owners run their business their way and figure out what that means because it needs to align with your values, what and who is important to you, and how you want to be perceived in the marketplace. And if you don't determine those things, they happen by accident. And you end up with a reputation that might not be how you want to be perceived. Yeah. Well, so many, I mean, one of the things about being an expert, coming out of corporate, coming out of a big firm, and many of us, myself included, um, we come out and we basically sell our expertise. We sell our time because uh, it is the easiest business model. And, and, uh, and we... It, it makes sense to us, right? It's the, the path of least resistance. And then there will come the time when sooner, sometimes sooner, sometimes later, where we kind of, you know, start to think about, you know, is there a more effective way for me to, you know, generate revenue and to share my expertise? But it's still a little bit controversial to leave behind that hourly um, model, especially among the professional services where it's pretty ingrained. What types of, when someone comes to you, well, one, what is, how do they recognize, okay, whatever I'm doing isn't working. I don't know what it is. That's why I need you. But how do they know that there's something missing, wrong, doesn't feel good, that they need you? And what is the pushback that you get when you try to help them see things in another way, if any pushback, but what what are the types of things that resistance that you see? I think there's always resistance to change, even when we want to change. Mm -hmm. It's scary. And that is the huge benefit of a trusting relationship. Mm -hmm. So the first thing that I do with my clients is build trust. I can't expect them to listen to me, to follow my advice, if we don't trust each other. And if I haven't created a safe space for them. So that is definitely the first step in my process. Mm -hmm. When we think about the hourly billing model, what I hear, I've done a lot of market research. I've asked these exact questions of my exact audience because I know what I believe, but I wanted to hear it from people who are struggling with the same things. Mm -hmm. And here's what I heard. Well, somehow I feel safer when I bill hourly, because then I'm being compensated for all my time, mm. right? I can't predict what this project is going to look like. So I can't possibly do a flat rate. Mm. I can't possibly do a retainer. I can't possibly use something other than hourly billing because then I'm going to be shortchanged. And the first step in that is shifting your mindset. So it's that safe space. Trust me. I've worked with, I have lost count of how many women business owners <laughs> I've worked with, and I've shown people how to do this differently. Mm -hmm. And here are the pitfalls with the hourly billing model. And here's the biggest one, in my opinion, that is when you're providing your service, you are really providing a transformation. Mm -hmm. Your clients don't come to you and say, um, I just need this one thing or give me this one piece of advice. Everyone that I work with, and I know for you, Erin, it's about building relationships. Mm -hmm. And you want clients who stick with you and understand the value that you bring. But the instant you charge hourly, you have just created a transaction. Mm -hmm. So you're providing a transformational service with a transactional pricing. And that not only causes a disconnect with your buyer, but it causes a disconnect in yourself. Right. And there's a conflict, there's this internal conflict because you know the value of what you're providing and yet you're not pricing that way. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so the first sign that most people recognize is feeling unfulfilled. They feel that internal conflict. And they feel as though I have no idea if I'm profitable. I'm mm -hmm. making money. Mm -hmm. I'm bringing money in. 
I like my clients, some of them, some of them I wish I could fire, you know, all of those thoughts are going through our minds. And we really don't have answers to the question of, am I doing this right? What am I doing wrong? What is the right answer? And my belief is there is no right answer. There's only a right answer for you, your right answer. And that's what I help you discover. So that is, um, I think the hourly billing model, you know, it's funny because the corporate model never worked for women. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work today. It never did. It was created by men for men. What do you mean by the corporate model? What is the corporate model is nine to five. Mm -hmm. You go into an office, Mm -hmm. there are lots and lots of employees and you're a cog in the wheel. Mm -hmm. right? And that's true of every corporation out there that has, let's say, more than 500 people. Mm -hmm. And there's a corporate model that was developed over the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, and really kind of came into its own in the 1950s. And again, was created by men for men, never worked for women. It really doesn't work for women today. That's why we see such an exodus out of corporate, because women realize, not just women, everyone realizes Mm -hmm. that they can generate revenue and build their business instead of doing it for someone else. Yes. Yeah. You know, that reminds me of, this was a couple of years ago, and there was an organization, I won't name names, but they were formed uh, to help more women become partners in big firms and uh, and also to create their own firms. And But they were using the same model that law firms currently use. Like, oh, and I was like, why would we want to buy into that? Like we want to like go, we want something different, we want something that works for women. We don't want to like figure out how we can work that system better. We want a new system that makes more sense. And, uh, and it went my, comments weren't well received, but I felt pretty strongly about that's not like, no, that, that's, I don't think that's what we need. I think we really need to redefine, you know, the, and there are a lot of uh, new ways to, to provide legal services that don't require that kind of structure that, you know, partner and then, you know, your underlings um, and that has more flexibility. And obviously COVID has made some changes there as well, but um, yeah, like not the old system. We don't want to, figure out how to fit into the old system better if we want to create new systems that make more sense for us. Yeah. Exactly. And that's true of the the kids now that are in their 20s, 30s, and 40s. Mm -hmm. That is exactly the the angst and the frustration that they're dealing with Mm -hmm. and why they're leaving those bigger companies in droves and starting their own things. Now, you and I both know that being a business owner is not easy. And if it was, everybody would be doing right. it. Right. But it is easier today with advanced technology than it's ever been. So th- that's why I think there's, it, it is so empowering for women in particular, because you can craft your life the way you want it, whatever that means to you. And that's what I mean about there's no right answer. There's no right way to run a business. There's only your way. And that's what I teach. So, well, that, that, I'm going to ask this. So do you have a signature way that you work with your clients or is it everyone is unique and you have whatever they need, wherever they come to you with, wherever they are in the journey, you, you craft something special for them, or do you have a signature solution or a, a framework that you work with? I do. So there are several different ways to work with me. One is one-on-one consulting. I also have a program called the Revenue Roundtable, and that is a group of women business owners who are experts in their fields. And one of the things I love about Revenue Roundtable is that it is, while it's very supportive and we all know each other well, we also challenge each other. And sometimes that is it's better, it's more instructive, and we learn more from those challenges than we do from the support. So the Revenue Roundtable is really a wonderful program. The 
other um, opportunity is a framework I call value-driven pricing. It is an online program that has a coaching component to it. And that fits with a second program called Painless Selling to Ideal Buyers. Mm. So those are two programs that I've developed for exactly the reason I mentioned before. My observation that all the sales programs out there were designed by men for men. Mm -hmm. I took a lot of them. They didn't work for me. And I developed my own. So value-driven pricing is to help you analyze what you're currently doing with your pricing, shift your mindset, perhaps from hourly billing to a different model. A lot of times we don't even realize what our choices are. So helping people realize all the different ways that you can price your services and then helping you build your pricing model. So it's not all theoretical and conceptual. It is very much mechanical. Once we can shift your mindset, have you thinking in a different way, understanding your choices, then I help you actually build the pricing model. And in painless selling, I help you actually figure out who is your ideal buyer? Where is your ideal buyer? How do you talk to your ideal buyer? That is a huge stumbling block right. for technical experts. Mm -hmm. And how do you talk to them? How do you get the value across to them? And how do you guide them so they're ready to buy? And those pieces put together help you figure out how you can customize to bring in the clients you want to work with, price in a way that is very profitable, and which then ultimately gives you even more choices because you're not on a feast and famine kind of roller coaster. Right. I will say that value pricing or value driven pricing is strikes fear in the hearts of many people. What, what is the hardest part of value driven pricing? That women feel like they're bragging mm -hmm. and they're very hesitant we are very hesitant to talk about ourselves. I know I am. I, it has taken me years and years and years yeah. to get comfortable talking about the value that I really bring. So I'll give you an example. Think about your network. You've probably spent your entire career building your network of colleagues, of clients, of former clients, of resources. But we don't think of that as valuable. So when, let's say you're an attorney and you, someone is coming to you and they, they need your help with a particular issue. When you're talking to them, you know in your own mind that as they need additional resources, you're going to make introductions mm -hmm. or you're going to suggest to them that they reach out to this type of specialist. That has incredible value because you trust the people that you're recommending right. and you've vetted them and you've gotten to know them. You've built that relationship. And yet we kind of disregard that mm -hmm. in our pricing. Mm -hmm. So helping, I really help my clients see pricing as a well-rounded issue. It's not any one thing. It's about how you build value in the mind of your buyer. Mm -hmm. Like being and able to communicate that value, effectively communicate. Able to value. communicate that yeah. value. And what I always say is we have a saying here in Texas, it's not bragging if it's true. <laughs> and it is so true. Sometimes women feel as though they have to continually prove themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's when they can price higher or differently. And you have proved yourself. Right. You've proved yourself in your corporate career, in your business in the relationships you've built, stop worrying about proving yourself and start worrying about communicating your value because then your pricing makes sense. And remember that as humans, we tend to equate high value and high price and low value and low price. Mm -hmm. So keep in mind, if you're keeping your, art your pricing artificially low, mm -hmm. people will perceive you differently. Absolutely. Yeah, I wrote a, a newsletter uh, piece about um, under 
promising and over delivering and how that is a sign that there's something wrong with your pricing or something wrong with your business model. Because if your client says, I want X outcome and that outcome is worth Y to them and you deliver that to them, then there's no under promising, you know, and no over delivery required. They got exactly what they wanted and that is valuable to them. And then you have priced it in a way that reflects that value. So that's the insecurity that comes from uh, either, you know, hourly billing. I, I think we see, we see a lot in hourly billing because like, oh, you know, I can't charge for that hour that I spent, you know, looking through whatever. Um, and, uh, or when you're, uh, and when you're artificially underpricing because you want to over deliver. So, yeah, yeah, I agree. Right. I, I refer to that as the double whammy for women. So we underprice and then we over deliver. Mm-hmm. So your profit just went poof, mm-hmm. right? And again, I'm going to go back to some of that jargon of the business model, the revenue model, and profit. And as women experts, we're delivering our service. We feel so good when we get those great results. Our clients value that tremendously. And yet our, cl- our businesses are often not profitable. And you can be profitable one month and not the next. So I think there's a real misunderstanding about what it means to be profitable and consistently profitable. Yeah, I think especially in service-based businesses, right? When you have a product, you think about you know inventory cost of goods sold, blah, blah, blah. And so you have this way of figuring out your profit where we, especially for thinking in terms of hourly um, rates, like, okay, well, you know, I'm making this much an hour. That's pretty good. And we're not really thinking about like, what is my profit? I mean, I, I think I rarely hear certainly solopreneurs, I use the term, um, who who are service-based talking about profits. I, I feel like exactly. I rarely hear that. Yeah. Yeah. No. And same for me. I, that's not what I hear women business owners talking about. Yeah. They worry about their pricing. Right. They stress about bringing in more and more clients, which I call the myth of more. Mm-hmm. Because more and more clients or more and more projects creates a whole new set of problems, yeah. right? Wait, so, yeah. so it's finding that balance of what works for you as the business owner, what is bringing in consistent revenue at, at, a, at a really appropriate level so that you're consistently profitable and um, probably more of that than we'd like to admit goes back to communication, Mm -hmm. how we talk about ourselves, how we talk to our buyers, to our clients, how we manage those client relationships. All of those pieces are often tricky for technical experts. Yeah. Yeah. We want to make sure like before we even think about scaling, whatever that looks like, we're making sure that we're starting from the right place. Because if you're, if, you know, do you want to scale an hourly, you know, model, like, Oh, you know, and so uh, making sure we're, we're starting in the right spot before we layer what could just make something more complicated, more burdensome and less profitable if we don't, we don't have the right pieces in place. So what trends are you seeing uh, in 2022 and beyond in that expert space? One trend that I've noticed over the last probably five or six months is a bit of a pullback, meaning I think there's so much fear of recession, inflation, of finding the right staff, whether they're contractors or employees or freelancers. It is very difficult to find people who will stick around. You can find people, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but not necessarily people who will stay. And that is a very expensive problem for small businesses. So I've seen a pullback in terms of, well, if I, it's a little bit of a spiral effect. If I scale back my business a little bit, I don't take as many clients. That means I don't need to have staff. That means I'll bring in less revenue, but I'll ride this out, even though my expenses are going up and there's a recession that we're headed towards, I'll ride this out. 
And if I can't write it out, I'll go back and get a job. Mm -hmm. Right Mm -hmm. now we do have that fallback, but to me, that is such defeatist thinking. Mm -hmm. And I understand the financial pressures, but we also have a lot of emotional pressures as women, because there are very few women that don't have other people relying on them, whether it's your staff, your parents, your grandparents, your kids, your brother and sister, Mm -hmm. we all have people relying on us and we don't want to let people down. Mm -hmm. So because of that, that defeatist attitude of I'll ride this out and just kind of hold my breath until I get to the next phase Mm -hmm. really works against you. And while we don't want to go to the opposite extreme of more and more clients, more and more projects, we do want to find that right balance where you're bringing in revenue at levels that do sustain you, that do account for inflationary prices. And one of the things I'll mention about that is when when you are stuck in a particular market, then these feelings are even worse. If you, if you don't have people who understand your value and are willing to pay you at the level that you think is appropriate, then you may be in the wrong market. By market, you mean the, the clients that you're serving. Correct. And because of that, that really strikes fear into people, right? Because, oh my goodness, how do, it's like starting all over. How do I find my ideal buyer And how do I even get my foot in the door? And that is exactly what I hear from my my buyers, my clients, and it is what I teach. Mm -hmm. And the reason is because it's such a common dynamic that we find ourselves in a market that doesn't appreciate us. Mm -hmm. And we know there are other markets out there, but we don't know how to approach them. And we don't know how to find those other buyers. And that is part of what I teach. So that's what I would caution in terms of trends that I'm seeing. I would caution your listeners to think differently if you can, that just writing it out is not going to get you where you want to go. And in fact, it's going to delay you getting where you want to go. That, that is great advice. So does that surprise you at all? Or is that kind of a sign of the times? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It doesn't surprise me. I think it is a sign of the times. I think it's true regardless of your gender. But I also think for women, we tend to be risk averse. And this feels very risky. So that's the other piece that fits in here that um, we want to be safe. We want to stay in a market we know where people know us, Mm -hmm. even if that might not be the best situation for our business. Right. Well, before we wrap up, I have a couple of questions I want to ask you. One is, you know, this is a very meta podcast, as I mentioned, I'm a female founder uh, who is the uh, founder of an expertise-based business that I am building to hopefully sell someday. And you are the founder of an expertise-based business. So my question for you is, are you building your business so you may be able to sell it someday? Yes. Mm -hmm. But one of the distinctions that I make is I'm really not interested in scaling my business. Mm -hmm. I love the people I serve and I love the, the way that I'm able to serve them. And I don't want to lose that. Mm -hmm. So And I will say that scaling is often not the goal for most of my clients. Mm -hmm. And what I do want to do is generate more revenue. I want more income and I want to, um, I want to make sure that I can be independent for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. That's very important to me. I'm single. I have been a single mom of three kids since my youngest was about two and he just turned 30. Wow. So I've raised my kids, gotten them all through school, college, grad school, helped them launch their careers. And now they're all three business owners That's and they help me in my company and I help them with their companies. Yeah. So 
my, so I want to remain independent. I want to, at some point, sell my company. I have developed intellectual property, mm -hmm. as you and I have talked about before. And I understand the importance and the value of that. And if there's an opportunity for me to sell my company in the future, I would be thrilled to do that. But I also love what I do and take so much joy in the work that I do. I can't imagine not doing this. Yeah. Yeah, you know, uh, that that's true. I have speak to a lot of women who look at their businesses that way. And we should, if we are successful, we have, we have a business doing what we love, serving clients that we love. And so, and sometimes it can feel like a betrayal to even think about selling that business. But I like to also think about like, there may be another chapter, like there, you know, there's always another challenge that we may want to conquer. And so we want to make sure that we're prepared for that. So if a new challenge, you know, catches our eye, that this is an asset that we can sell that could help fund that next challenge, that next chapter. So we don't want to kind of be put blinders to the idea of, of selling a business just because we can't imagine it or because it feels like a betrayal to our clients. Um, but we want to make sure we're building those assets so that, you know, and, and I mean, you said you're not interested in scaling, but at the end of the day, you know, increasing revenue while increasing profit is scaling. And I think that's what you said you wanted to do. So. <laughs> that is true. I think the distinction is I don't necessarily want to get bigger. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. I don't want to have a situation where I'm not in contact with my clients. Yes. Yes. That makes yes. Sense. Yes. Yes. So, you know, uh, one of the reasons that I started um, Think Beyond IP and working with female founders is because I want to work to build a more equitable economy. And so uh, I, uh, is there a organization or a person who you admire, who is helping, you know, kind of, bring more equity to our society? Yes. Um, I have been a longtime donor to an organization called Girls Inc. It's a national organization with local chapters, and they are teaching young girls and young women to really step into their power mm -hmm. and to find the language that they need so they can speak up. And I think that is so important. It ties directly into my mission of empowering women. And I think starting with girls is so smart. Mm -hmm. And there are so many issues that, that cause problems for young girls. I think for all young people. Mm -hmm. But Girls Inc. is an organization that I have supported for many years. And I really believe in the work they do. That's fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. We will absolutely make sure that is in the show notes. So where can people, well, first of all, do you have an offer that you'd like to share with the audience? I do. I would love to invite your audience to take a quiz that I've developed. It's My Revenue Roadblocks, and it's designed to help you understand what might be in your way when it comes to changing your pricing or maybe raising your prices. Mm -hmm. And when you do, when you take the quiz, you get a report that will help you understand what some of those limiting beliefs are that you may be struggling with and the first step you can take to address that. So if you go to my website at theblockgroup.net, theblockgroup.net, you'll see a link to the quiz, My Revenue Roadblocks. And I really would encourage you to take that and uh, see what you learn from it, because the first step to any change is to become aware. Fantastic. Thank you for that. So you mentioned the blockgroup.net website. Where else can people find you? On LinkedIn. Fantastic. And it's Patty with a Y, Patty Block. And I love connecting with people on LinkedIn. And when you reach out to me, please mention this interview so I can connect the dots. And I will be very happy and honored to connect with you. Well, this has been wonderful, Patty. Thank you so much for being with us and sharing your wisdom. And, uh, and there's a lot of great, great information for, for the audience. So thank you again. Thank you.